Yet more drama was to come on the second ever LV Game of the Week, another to be enjoyed by the bowlers and hated by the batsmen, the first of whom to fall was Ben Brown in the second morning's fifth over, Jitan Patel with the catch in the slips. That put Sussex on 156 for six in reply to Warwickshire's first innings 180, and it was soon 160 for seven for the home side when Chris Jordan gave Ricky Clark his second wicket of the morning with a regulation catch behind. Jordan was on his way for two. Next over, and it appeared that Warwickshire would muster a first innings advantage when Keith Barker trapped Ollie Robinson in front for a single. Sussex had by now slipped from their strong position of 115 for two to 161 for eight, six wickets falling for 46 runs in the space of 19 overs. The only man who dealt with the conditions throughout was Luke Wells, who resumed his innings on 73 and looked as if he was going to carry his bat throughout as he moved into the 90s. But having just taken his side into a slender lead, he gave Patel his fourth wicket to go for 92, which was a fraction under half of the runs on the board overall, the ball not bouncing much. It had been a terrific knock in conditions in Hove, which once again favoured the bowlers a little too much, as it had done in the last championship game here against Middlesex. Chris Wright then finished off the innings by removing Matthew Hobden LBW, Sussex having to make do with a lead of just 11, as they were all out for 191, in which Patel claimed figures of 4 for 24. Warwickshire had to make changes to their batting order. Ian West were damaging a finger while batting on the first day, which saw Attic Javin open with Varun Chopra, only for the latter to go quickly to Steve McGoffin. Warwickshire came up with a plan to counter the surface, and that was to promote Wright to number three, possibly to see if he could negate the threat of the new ball. He's batted well this season, but it was a risky policy, one which looked as if it might work, as Wright and Javin did something rare in this match and that was to develop a partnership. It might have only been worth 43 runs, but in the context of this match, that was quite a lot. Tony Pigott, an ECB liaison officer, was on his way to the ground to inspect a pitch which was still causing problems. Wright ducked, but the ball from McGoffin didn't get up as expected. Given the events of the winter, nobody wants to see players look dazed after being struck on the head. Thankfully, Wright was OK, and after a lengthy delay, the play continued. Wright bravely fought on and was soon having to duck out of the way of a ball which did rise up on this occasion. Batting had not been easy throughout and was clearly getting no easier. Wright did well to make 22 out of a score of 49, but there was perhaps an inevitability that his wicket would soon come. Hobden got it with the first ball of a fine spell, an edge carrying to Jordan who doesn't miss those. That brought in Jonathan Trott, who decided that the best form of defence was to attack, and he went over third man off Hobden for a six, as he and Javid added 38 runs in only 27 deliveries. Trott had made 16 of those when he was another, finding the ball doing a little too much, and an edge off Hobden was again grasped by Jordan to leave Warwickshire on 87 for three. A score which soon became 91 for four in the next over, as Javid's 93-minute knock was brought to a conclusion on 27 by Robinson, a leading edge sending the ball into the hands of Chris Nash. Warwickshire now four down with a lead of 80 runs on the board. Sussex would not be wanting to chase too many, and so they would not have been too happy to see Tim Ambrose come out and play in this manner. He went after Robinson, who perhaps as expected was not able to repeat his heroics of the previous day. Ambrose found the boundary four times in one Robinson over as the visitors decided to put the pedal to the metal to try to get as many runs as they could before a ball with a batsman's name was sent down. This was excellent counter-attacking cricket from Ambrose, who was starting to produce just the kind of innings his side so badly needed if they were going to be in with a shout of making it three wins in succession in this competition. Although he was batting well and seeing the ball well enough, he too was hit in the side of the helmet by a quick ball from Hobden, which perhaps followed the batsman a bit. This time a new piece of headgear was called for. Some may have expected a motorbike helmet to be sent out instead of the normal kind of one. Ambrose dusted himself off and more boundaries took him to a score of 32 and around a runner ball, but having got that far, the keeper went after a wide delivery from Hobden and Nick behind, leaving with his side on 126 for five for a lead of 115. 
Hobden grabbed his fourth wicket of the innings in his next over. Laurie Evans' resistance, which had seen him battle it out for 50 minutes for his nine runs, ended as he just didn't get enough of his bat behind the ball. Sussex were right on top again when, in the next over, having already been dropped and taken a ball on his elbow, Bark had his off stump flattened by McGoffin. On his way for a duck at 134 for seven. Warwickshire now 123 runs ahead and with no sign of Westwood coming out to bat. But two players who've seen it all before in this game then came together to frustrate the home attack for eight overs before bad like took the players off the field, probably much to the batsman's relief. Batting was a tough occupation and fading light was not going to help anyone but the bowlers. Clark and Patel were able to add 46 runs for the eighth wicket before they all went off just after tea and that could turn out to be a crucial partnership come the end of this contest. Clark hit that six and then faced a ball from Jordan under the lights which could have swung around a corner. If there are many more deliveries like that then Warwickshire may feel that they already have enough runs on the board. These were the views from both camps after another extraordinary day. But if we can bowl them out cheaply tomorrow morning, then I, def I think there's a very good chance that we can chase down the runs. Especially if, like I said earlier, if Wellesley and well, if someone shows the determination and, and the, the grit that he showed in the first innings, then I think there's a different chance that we, we can win. We've got we've got a score already that we can have a bowler. So um, anything we get tomorrow is a bonus, and we'll be trying to pinch as many as we can. How difficult is it out there for the batsman? Well, that's an understatement. It's, uh, it's not impossible at times. Um, if you put it in the right area, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's pretty hard. I think guys were just hoping to put balls under a bit of pressure, and if we could pinch a few runs before we got out, uh, as a bonus, really. Warwickshire will go into day three then on 180 for seven, and that's put them 169 runs ahead. Sussex will need to finish off the innings quickly on day three, and then see how the pitch plays from there. There is, of course, still all to play for.